What's going on, my fellow reef builders? What is going on, my longtime reefing homie, Mark Vanderwall? How's it going, Jake? I like your shirt. Oh, thank you very much. I got it at the grocery store for like six ninety five. It wasn't even on sale. Nice. But uh, man, I've had a lot of stuff happening at the studio. There's a part of me that's just like, I know there's like a shipping apocalypse coming, so I got all the things I think I'm going to need, and boy, have I been busy. Shipping apocalypse? What am I missing? What, what should I be ordering? <laughs> Anything. Everything. Really? I, I don't want to be part of the problem. Go, okay. Go look. <laughs> yeah. Right. Go search it on your own. But, um, you know, so I guess a handful of weeks ago, I talked about getting that rainbow red carpet anemone. That was mm. pretty big. And, man, I'm not even sure how this materialized. But in my DMs, um, someone added me about a... Uh, uh, blue carpet anemone that was available and uh, mm. it was a fair price and I was like yeah I'm not really dropping cash on livestock right this moment I am up for trades for some you know what would be considered mini colonies nowadays and my book is still frags so I received a massive massive blue carpet anemone and I thought it would be manageable enough to put in the coral flat where i already have like half of my anemones and it was just so big i i had already prepared the top row of the mode rack yeah to as a as a stepping stone to turning the whole rack into the uh, anemone system and uh put it in there and it is i don't know like 16 by 16 inches just like t almost filling the entire thing absolutely bonkers. that is big it's re it's really big, but it was a cool opportunity too. Um, I've had some uh, three foot Nicobar LED strips um, for a while, and I've just been waiting for like the right application to install them. And uh, because they are focused, I was able to really like bring them to the front and angle them back, and just get a really good gangster lean on uh, the the way the, the the lights point backwards. And man, I'll tell you what this this top rack with essentially no filtration. It's just a maxi jet kind of just jammed into a sponge filter that blows across the two sections to you know the two dividers so three sections there's and then rare stone right so there's no biomedia well I, I take that back i did take three or four like bio ceramic balls from max spec and just toss them up there as a little just a tiny little bit of help yeah. but man now that i've got it going i'm like it doesn't make sense for me to like kind of save the mode rack for fish that i might be getting and have this one the top third earmarked for anemones when i already have the anemones <laughs> and i don't have these other fish i want so now i'm like oh snap i'm gonna have to s reverse this right so i'm gonna have to do some good water changes on the mode rack and then somehow figure out like a uh, playing musical tanks just take all the fish out take the anemones put them down and take whatever unplaced fish and put them on the top rack and keep that as a actual quarantine mini system. Yeah, it sounds like a little, any any. I was gonna say that sounds like a little bit of work. Any concerns about like residual medication or anything like that? I never have. I've never worried about that. I know back in the day we were always so. All right, well, so of, I mean, like, copper in the silicone and then the well, rock. we also used mm -hmm. copper like it was just a panacea in yeah. all <laughs> kinds of fish tanks <laughs> with all of our dolomite and and you know coral skeletons and you know when you sure when you have that massive amount of uh, mineral compounds in your tank of course they can leach a bunch of stuff but as we're about to talk when we get into the um, our discussion of the marine aquarium reference systems and invertebrates book by martin mo um, that might be kind of misfounded so no i don't have <laughs> any concerns um, about like antibiotics they break down super fast i've literally been using antibiotics on corals on purpose yeah. and treating my tanks with antibiotics um, to try to snuff out this weird, I don't know, it's like, I, I call it a gremlin because it's like that weird unknown problem that just keep pops up and it hits that coral and then it hits that coral. And now I'm, I'm getting a lot more comfortable with straight chem and cleaning my tanks on a dime. Just make sure to add a ton of aeration, turn off the skimmer, give it two days. And um, I can't, I can't really put my finger on it, man, but the corals that I've treated with ChemiClean, um, I may have mentioned this before, but now I've got two more tanks that have gone through the treatment. This is, again, mind you, this is not at all to get rid of cyano. 
the corals that I've treated, it's just like it's like a week or two later, they really start to look themselves like just really blossom. You know, and there's a difference between a bubble coral being open, you know, seven eight inches, and then being open fifteen inches, and being almost a problem. Yeah. So to answer your question, I'm not worried about about residuals at all. I'm curious because you have gram positive and gram negative bacteria, right? And then you have antibiotics for each. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know enough about that stuff to even be qualified to talk about it. But I, I wonder what the antibiotic that we use to treat cyano and like chemiclean, which one it targets. It'd be kind of interesting. Have you thought about doing like an aqua biomics type of test or something like that? If for a tank that you know has this weird gremlin? I have, but I think think that aquabiomics is just now like knocking on the door of having the the tools necessary to um really identify what is in that water all right so this is <laughs> i've got a list and we're totally like jumping all over the place Sorry, yeah no, no, you're, no, you, this, you, this you say something and then i've got so many questions no this is an awesome <laughs> awesome like segue into something i wanted to talk about i wasn't sure if i was going to mention it today but like today i wrote up this book right here um, by Andre Ryansky. He's actually been sharing some awesome photographs of like Red Sea reef life. You know, he yeah. looks at stuff. I don't think he's an aquarist, but he's just a, like a little bit tapped in. So he showed us some crazy pictures of um, some some toddy backs and some antheas from the Red Sea. I'm assuming he's Euro European with you know Andre Ryansky. Um, but he's got six books, and they're small little books, like 15 bucks for. Uh, Kindle edition, $25 for the hardcover. And you see all these books next to me? I've got books on nudibranchs, on crustaceans, several on giant clams, tons on fish, some on certain groups of fish. And there is not, I don't have, I've never really seen one good book on starfish and echinoderms. There are usually like a footnote or a small section in like, a general field guide so I got this for one specific purpose I wanted to finally identify the starfish that we've been calling Asterina mm -hmm. because I because Asterina like the true Asterina is bat stars and those things are like seven eight inches across um, the, the arms are like a lot more conjoined than the ones we see so halfway to like a sand dollar or something but isn't it and also like uh, a family of starfish that are Asterina like it's sort of almost yeah. too generic Right. Mm -hmm. So we've been calling Masterinas for about 20 years. And when I finally got this book, I found the ID for Asterinas. In 2006, there was a huge revision on the tiny so-called Asterinas, and it's Aquilonostra. Yeah. Aquilonostra. That brings me back to the aquabiomics thing, right? Because um, this one tank, my Red Sea tank, that has all the Montes and has a huge resident population of um, uh, the starfish, it showed on my aquabiomics text that there was no presence of Asterina starfish. Do you see where I'm getting now? Yeah. So aquabiomics, they didn't make their own genetic markers. They pulled these from readily available gene banks and compared them to what we call Asterinas but they pulled a gene sample for something that is not at all Asterina. So there's probably no gene bank samples for Aquilonostra for them to reference. Do you see what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's, everything is in the early stages. I feel like our grandkids <laughs> are gonna benefit from this technology a lot more than we will. I mean, we might be helped to like elucidate um, the directions that it should go, but I'm not sure if we're gonna reap the benefits. So that's your <laughs> that's my long roundabout answer to have you done an aquabiomics test? Here's hoping though, because I mean things could get worse, right? In terms of mm -hmm. the the passion for properly knowing what you're talking about or identifying. I mean, I, somebody's going to challenge me on this, but the other misinformation around that <coughs> uh, starfish is. Um, People usually say that, you know, they're a th I, I've heard so many times that they are predatory on your corals when, you know, most of the documentation around, like, say, the genus that you mentioned, uh, it, it flat out says they consume algal and bacterial mats. And you can see them. What's what they do the, in your on tank. On the glass. Yeah, yeah they come out yeah. at night all over your glass, you know. Um, that being said, once in a while, if I have a coral that's suffering, I'll see them kind of swoop in 
like maybe like vultures or something like they smell something and I really see them more as like leeches like right. you know pulling out or the maybe tissue. bacterial mat on the coral because the coral yep. got before some issues. the coral suffers yeah yeah uh-huh. I don't know um, and what's neat is only a few of them will cue in right so if I just leave it alone those two or three or four will sit there and they're munch and munch and munch but I'll pull those out and no others come and fill that role. So it's a very localized effect of the so-called asterinas um, coming in and qu- eating your coral. Like that's just, that's not what they do. But then again, first of all, they're not asterinas. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Second of all, I think there's seven or eight different species in um, uh, Ryansky's book. And I think the big revision in 2006 mentioned like 15 of them. You know, oh, across yeah. the Indo-Pacific. And so that stuff is like, on the one hand, it's really exciting, you know, for knowledge and truth seekers like you and me. Like, oh, my God, this is real tangible information that we can start to hang data on. But on the flip side, we're also alone. <laughs> we're also alone because people are just, they're going to be calling Masterinas for like 15 more years. You know, I, I, I feel compelled to give them a common name and start uh, linking that up to something else. Although there's not so much a too much harm in calling them asterinas in the tropical aquarium world, as long as we recognize that it's not going to match the gene sample from GenBank or something. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I saw your post on Instagram about it and... Um, that led me down the Google rabbit hole and you know mm. you go to the Wikipedia page and there's just this long list of species under that genus right if you have the like, right name yeah I have been I have been drilling down Google Scholar for like micro starfish small brill starfish or small biscuit starfish asterina like starfish and I could never find it but the divers they've known or at least Andre did and then as soon as I had the right name it's like, boom, there's a Wikipedia article. Boom, there's all the articles you could ever want on Google Scholar where, you know, you can drill down and learn about this animal that is very common in our reef tanks. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. And you see people attacking them with, you know, harlequin shrimp and stuff. And I, they can be nuisancey when they get into really crazy populations. But then I also sort of equate them as another... Um, canary in the coal mine right like if you've got a bazillion bristle worms or you have a bazillion of these stars like it might mean that you know uh, there's something from a nutrient or bacterial level in your tank that's you know or whatever you know like there there might be excess food who knows right um oh, no there it's no might if there's not excess food they're not there right right they have to have the excess food right so yeah anytime you're pulling out bristle worms or stomatellas or Asterinas, you know that y- you are you're actually breaking part of your your ecology of your reef. I was about to say, like you're removing the helpers, right? Like, hey, yeah. we'll eat this stuff. <laughs> you, you know why they're not popular? Because stores can't sell them. Well, you know, that is yeah, that's part of it. You know, st- have you ever seen a store that sells so much stomatellas? No, they, I love every, stomatellas, dude. Everyone loves stomatellas. But, you know, they're just so easy to propagate yourself and they're hard to, like, go around all the tanks and harvest, like, in commercial quantities. That's They're not a commercial animal. So, you know, vendors would rather sell you pods and things that are known, you know, to be cultured rather than things that are known to really actually, you know, consume uneaten food and algae and detritus. Well, and it's, I, I don't, again, I don't want to say... I, this is opinion, right? I don't have enough experience, but a lot of these pods that are sold, do they readily reproduce well enough and have good, I guess the word would be fecundity or, you know, like where they they thrive in captivity over time or do they kind of fizzle out? And then here you have proof, right? Like these, these type of microorganisms or, you know, like, like bristle worms, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that Latin name for the new genus name, but Aquilonastra. Aquilonastras, um, stomatellas. Nastra. Um, We're going to call them Nastra starfish. That's the other thing. It's like Asterina <laughs> rolls off the tongue a lot easier, so maybe that helps propagate the misinformation. Nastra. Oh, those Nastras. are Nastra starfish. 
Okay. Hey, that's actually yo, good. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, hit us up if you guys have any Nastra starfish in your tank. <laughs> but I mean, these are uh, maybe not microorganisms, but they're they're organisms that n are known to thrive in our tanks, right? But maybe a little unsightly for you know when you're trying to take a picture of your tank and there's 30 of them on the front glass. But I mean, you know, to me, that's the st I love that stuff. I love all Keep the little it real man the critters. Keep you know, it I, I love the critters I can actually see. Yeah, for sure. Do you remember Except that tank? Worms. It, when we went to Inner Zoo many years ago, and there's like a restaurant we ate dinner at that had saltwater tangs. tangs. Okay. It was tangs. <laughs> and he had these uh, small little stars that were very similar to ones we have in America, but they had like pink streaks on them. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, the the tanks itself were great, but I just zeroed right in on that. I'm like, what what are those? You know, like in Europe, they have like a whole different pest starfish, you know, or nuisance well, starfish. <laughs> they're not pests. They're not nuisance. They're no, just I a know. Different I'm nastra just using starfish. That in, I guess in quotes, right? I have noticed about three varieties in the United in the United States. There's a kind of like a generally modeled one that's pretty camouflaged. There's one that kind of has kind of a a steel blue gray patch on the top and then there's one that has like one to a few you know kind of dull red dots in the center and i've seen others in other people's tanks I'm, i mean from what i've seen they're pretty much the same i think i have those three in my tanks right now but i do remember you post pointing out the nastra starfish at uh at tangs and it's yeah it's really interesting for such a small thing they're probably like eviotas right there's probably like 50 freaking species but people just haven't looked for them in yeah. all corners of the globe to be like oh my god these are these are like insects of starfish everywhere <laughs> yeah that's true yeah yeah they're but i mean um, you mentioned something about, uh, you know, getting the IDs right. And I'm going to give a special shout out to Hayden Sims of Artistic Oceans in Las Vegas. Uh, I think he picked up on me lamenting the fact that I couldn't find Marilena everywhere. I think this was on our naming uh, our, uh, session, right? Because I was talking about how I finally got myself a nice piece of Marilena, but it was labeled as a uh, platygyra. <laughs> so he held on to a piece what, I like three months because it was Las Vegas and it was summertime and it was super hot. So like, well, let's just wait till it's, you know, nice and cool. And then he was out of town and I was out of town. So anyway, yesterday I finally got them. Um, and it was just so nice. He actually labeled them. I think he probably collected another one um, and label. Uh, so he got me a Marilina Ampliata, which is kind of a little smoother, a little rounded and a Marilina Scabricula, which is a little bit more sharp edged, um, a little bit more, like blade branching like blades kind of growing into each other mm -hmm. and it's just so freaking cool especially since last weekend i picked up another marilina that was just you know uh maricultured from one of the local stores and i'm like oh man i'm kind of swimming in marilina now <laughs> i need just a couple more and i'm like all right i got that marilina situation handled um but another thing he sent me that i'd been talking about is uh, a small baby clown trigger fish like, I know he's going to be a headache now, but God, it's looking at a baby tr clown trigger fish immediately transports me to being like 14 or 15 and walking through, you know, the questionable uh, aquarium stores. It might have even been a pet shop that had an aquarium section, but, you know, dolomite, underground filter, dead coral everywhere. But when you're starting in freshwater and you see a fish like that, you're like, that doesn't, that just does not compute how crazy cool and unreal it is. So, so now I have a pet clown triggerfish, and he's hardy enough that I think I'm going to call him Cosmic. Oh, in, in, in homage reference, yeah. To Cosmo, the famous clown triggerfish that had his own column in Freshwater and Marine Aquarium magazine. Yeah, I know. I, I don't think it was uh, on the podcast. It might have been before or after we started recording. But we talked about just these fish that we've either never kept or, you know, um, sort of get overlooked. And, and, and especially when you get stuck in the coral world, right? There's like a mm -hmm. laundry list of fish you just immediately dismiss at that point. And at that point, I had set up the new tank upstairs but i still had the old tank lingering in the house and i was debating doing something with it and we talked about just you know it'd be great to have a tank for those type of fish and like i've al I, I i remember talking to you like i've always wanted to keep a clown trigger more like a pet almost like an oscar yes. right like yep. a freshwater mm -hmm. oscar um i mean i'd be happy with a 
I don't know, Picasso trigger, but they're just so full of personality. But you definitely, it has, you have to kind of build your tank mates around it and, and mm-hmm. what you want to do with it. You know, Absolutely. It's, it's definitely, uh, it's not just a random pretty fish you throw in to add color to a reef tank. Like No, it, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really considering how I'm going to train this fish and tame this fish to not be a monster. Yeah. Basically. So he's really small now. As soon as he gets through quarantined, I know I know Hayden had him for a long time, but you know, I do my own thorough quarantine. I'll pop him in the fish tank and he'll be like the smallest fish in there and I'll just keep a really, really close eye on him. Um, and I've had a line spot trigger fish for a long time that uh, Rob Mouget gave to me and I'm going to give it back to him because he had two and he gave me one and um, something happened to his other one. And so it, it's just nice to return the favor. I'm like, hey, yeah. here's your fish back a little fatter, a little bigger <laughs> about a year and a half later. <laughs> and yeah, no, the clown trigger is just one that really, really speaks to me. But I got another really, really cool fish that arrived alive despite FedEx. You know, I want, I want to be really upset at FedEx because there was another fish in there that didn't make the journey. It was, But this is the, only, the first shipment from any vendor that was delayed, a, a, the first overnight shipment that missed a day. And um, the Siphopurpurescence. Do you know which one I'm talking about? No. It's in between like a regular dotty back or like a Murai dotty back and then the really big Dampira dotty backs that used to be a lot more common in the aquarium hobby. And it's crazy because... Um, you know, he looks like a he looks like a firefish. He looks like a firefish dotty back. Not as crazy colored, right? But then when I put the Nico bar on it with like that really punchy blue, all of a sudden that blue edge to every scale like totally started popping. And I've only seen these fish in displays maybe like a couple times. And wholesalers more than that, and they just don't look like anything. Um, and they're, you know, they can be really secretive. The males are much more attractive than the females. But um, again, he's going to go in in, a, in the reef tank, and it's one of those fish. Um, kind of hope I kind of hope he's like sort of cryptic, and just every now and then I, I get a flash of color. Yeah, those are always the best fish. I always like yeah. that with the uh, like the different types of cave basslets, right? I candy basslets were way too expensive for me, but like a swell mm-hmm. AC or. Those are those were cool because you would just see them around feeding time, kind of hover in the darkness and come out and mm-hmm. eat something. And I don't know, I like those kind of fish because the fish that are always in your face begging for food, you you sort of get bored with their presence after a while. <laughs> so. The line spot trigger falls in that category. He's just, I mean, I can walk over to the food shelf like forty feet. You know, everything's line of sight here in the studio. There's no obstructions. You can pretty much see everything from everywhere. But when I walk over to the food shelf, the trigger goes crazy. Like before I even grab anything off of it. <laughs> I can just look back and see him, uh, you know, 30, 40 feet away, just losing his mind. I'm like, all right, dude, calm down. Calm down. I know the, tr- the clown trigger is not going to be different, but at least a clown trigger is going to, you know, have that connection with something in my past. Yeah. In my, oh, in my that's important. History. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the sifo is is really cool. Um, let's see. I got one little rant to get out there. This is part of the reef therapy. I got some uh, bunch of like cloud enabled pH meters, mm-hmm. and uh, I calibrated them with a supplied calibration solution. Then compared them to my Hanna Halo Blue. I think, or just Halo pH pen, my Bluetooth one. And that one is just so fast and it's just kind of my baseline and it can do a three point calibration. But when I, when I calibrated these pH, these expensive kind of, you know, premium cloud enabled pH prep pens, um, they were a little bit off. And then I was just like, all right. And I recalibrated them a few times with the supplied calibration solution. Mind you, I'm the guy who is really going out above and beyond to make sure that the temperature is 25 degrees. You know, I put my calibration solutions in a water bath with a with the temperature probe. I'm trying to get everything as right as possible. And I'm doing this over and over. I'm like, what the hell? So then I switched to the Hanna calibration solutions. And that bought me an extra point closer to being accurate or in line with the Halo pen. And... It's not, this is not even a, men, a, 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 a criticism of the this particular monitor because it's still really new and it's got some, some kinks to iron out. But it just made me wonder. It's just like, how many people, they, you know, they spend 
I don't know, twenty dollars, fifty dollars on a pH pen, you know, just the little dippers, and or hundred or two hundred dollars on a, a standalone pH monitor, or you know, m- calibrate the pH um, probe from any number of controllers, and they just take that to the bank. They just assume that that number is right because it's digital, right? But the tool is, it's only as good as like its calibration. And then the calibra- calibra- calibration solutions are only as good as how you use them. And I'm just wondering like how many people are chasing pH just not realizing that their pH probe could be like 0.2 off. And they're, they're chasing this number that could already be there. But they just assume because it's digital, it's electronic, that it must be uh, it must be correct, and it's the, you know it's just not that way. And you know it, it, that that really shows when you have multiples of something, right? If you set up a handful of pH monitors with the exact same calibration solution, with the same probes, they're not going to give you the exact reading. They're no. just not. Well, and this goes back to um, chasing numbers and. The idea that um, if you're chasing an exact number, how do you know that your the your unit of measurement, right, the the thing you're using to measure uh, and monitor for that number, is accurate, right? And I mean, um, I have hygrometers to measure humidity in my house, all over my house, and I've calibrated them all, right? But you put them all in the same room, and they will variate, and you know, I think the take home message is from, you know, most people that have been in a hobby long enough is like, don't chase a number, um, use it to monitor drift, right? So patterns, patterns, patterns and right. behaviors. That's so it. That's the only thing I'm using mine for. I got one on the freshwater tank so I can see the effect of carbon dioxide dosing and you know, how high and how low it gets throughout the day. And I got one in the tank and I know the, after all my work, like hours and hours of calibrating and recalibrating and a long phone call with Hannah, um, it's just it's just point one off. It's just point one lower than what it should be, but it's still going to show me the trends. And then I put one in my calc reactor, which I've never done, so I can you know, really learn how long it lasts the way that I'm running it. Yeah, and usually the the shift, the change will be consistent, right? So if you have a pH meter that says it's 8.3 and one that says 8.2, but your pH drops at the same rate, they'll Mm -hmm. drop at the same subtraction amount. Obviously the end value will be different because your starting value is different. It's the same with um, people, uh, body fat, right? Measuring body fat. And if you're trying to get into shape and lose weight, it's like, well, is your body fat 18% or is it 20%? It doesn't matter. It's just you have a baseline measurement now, and if you're trying to lose weight, and you step on that scale that may not be super accurate, the rate of ch- the the amount of change will be fairly accurate. So if you drop two percent, doesn't matter what your starting point is. And so yeah, I. But oh man, you bring up pH, I'm gonna have to hold back because there's so much more I want to question oh, about book? it. No, just in part. general, but the book the, the book got me thinking about it, but yeah. Um, All right, so for I'll those of you who are listening <laughs> and are watching, you know, we are going to be reviewing books p- um, periodically. I, I did not get past chapter one of this book, and uh, we're going to dive into that um, and just talk about all the um, brain nuggets that it unearthed in my mind. I, 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 I skimmed some of the other chapters, um, but chapter one, I feel, is like where the, all the meat is at. But I still have one more thing I want to talk about. So, you know, last last uh, uh, session, we really talked about, like, the affordability and the cost of reef tanks. And I don't, I don't know if my, you know, people, don't, like, the, here's the problem with the social media and the Instagram culture. People don't scroll down. <laughs> <laughs> they don't they don't read anything that's beyond a week old or a month old and i'm like yeah i mean peppered in with all my talk of like some of the highest priced most premium aquarium products you know i've always talked about using these higher performing products to get by with less that's why i don't have controllers on any of my aquariums you know, if I had one aquariums, yeah, sure, I'd throw a lot of bells and whistles at it, and I have done that before. But since I have a bunch of aquariums, I'd rather have the basics really, really going. But 10 years ago, I did this reef called Eco, well, 12 years ago, I did a reef called Eco Reef 1, which was my first tank ever without any live rock, which, dude, I was nervous. 
I was nervous about using only ceramic rock because we didn't have a, a steady supply of artificial or ceramic rock there. So I thought I was really like busting the mold there with Eco Reef One had zero live rock, just ceramics and a bunch of coral. And that was my first LED lit tank. And then that naturally progressed into Eco Reef Zero, which I'm now calling Zero Reefs. And it's just a box with a coral and an internal filter. And I know you, you did that with like an elegance about. coral, right? Yeah, it was just there was something about it. Just I wouldn't call it a reef tank. It was absolutely a coral tank. And um, I man, I've been trawling Amazon so hard because there's so much crap out there. Some of it has to be good. <laughs> Some of it has to be good. So I've been kind of applying my decades of uh, aquarium uh, product reviewing experience and just really like drill down some into some brands that I think are way better than their price suggests. So, you know, same thing with the shipping apocalypse. I went ahead and placed an order for like about five nano lights, five nano filters, three nano heaters, and that was 200 bucks. And I'm going to be setting up a whole section in the studio. It's going to be called very, very creatively the Nano Reef Builder Studio. <laughs> it's just going to be one shelf, and it's going to be tank after tank after tank of setups that basically cost a hundred dollars minus the livestock i've thought a lot about our discussion as well by the fact too that um a lot of other youtubers are talking about is the hobby getting expensive so it just i couldn't get away from it right i'd open the up hobby's my not getting expensive the messaging is stuck on premium well right and and i think um you know they all I don't think there was a general disagreement with what we said because a lot of them also just talked about like if you have an Instagram account and you're trying, you have followers and you, or you have a YouTube account, you know, are you going to do a big old hype video on an $800 light? Or are you going to do it on like a, 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 you know, a cheaper Chinese light, you know, like uh, from Alibaba or whatever. Um, and I, I get their arguments on that too. But anyway, the, the thing that, so I, I was wondering, like, is there people out there, are there people, <laughs> excuse my grammar, out there making videos focused on affordable reef keeping? And, and there are, but there was also, you know, from your usual hit YouTube channels, it, they, oh, they all covered the topic at one point or another in the past, but there was always a focus on nano reef keeping. And so for me, the, the question was, again, it's, well, it's like, how do you quantify affordable? But... I think the point is like you and I had tanks that you wouldn't consider nano long ago when we were, bro I mean, I set my first real reef tank when I was a freshman in college, like talk about being broke, right? Right. Um, and we really DIY'd it, right? And so the, I feel like if you make a video about like, you know, budget reef keeping, but it's like a 10 gallon nano, that's fair because that is one way that you can uh, keep things affordable because filling the tank with coral and fish is, is another budget, right? That's, that's totally subjective. So that I'm keeping that out of my price True. description because with a little bit of sleuthing and um, a little bit of begging, you can f get a lot of coral for free. But a what lot I of little feel, scraps of corals. And I mean, there are videos here and there, but what I feel is missing is the messaging around an affordable reef tank that's 40 gallons or 70 gallons right and um I, d I i don't want it all to be so focused on like nano reef keeping um because i think you can I mean, you talked about like eco reef one and eco reef zero like talking about using lace rock like you know you can keep marine life in a larger system and yeah your cost for salt may go up a bit and you're going to have to get some more rock but and but it's still in the range of affordability. You know, is it going to be a hundred dollars? No, it's going to be probably like five hundred bucks, maybe. You know, for a decent seventy. What I'm trying to, what I'm hoping to achieve, is if I demonstrate six or nine times, six or nine setups yeah. that each cost a hundred dollars, you'll see that it's not a fluke. Right. right. So and you can extrapolate that that's scalable. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Like what works Yo, for a you, nine you got a 75 gallon, gallon tank. You want to put a, a couple power heads, not even propeller pumps, a couple power heads on there, an Emperor 400 power filter, 
And if you do it right, yeah, you're looking at about three hundred dollars for a three foot tank. Right. Yeah. Easy, easy. You know, and I'm, I'm to me, it's actually going to be the beginning of a movement of the zero reef. So just like, and it's not, I, dude. Don't get me wrong. I love my toys. I love my toys. But I've been looking at this GNC Blu-ray right here under my TV. It's a I got a sticker price of thirteen hundred dollars. I'm just like, after our talk last week, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, man, you could set up like three really nice medium sized reef tanks for the cost of that one light. No, I, what I want people to understand is it's like the premium equipment, like especially in reading all the older literature and this book is we, because the livestock is so premium, we wanted to safeguard it. But that doesn't mean that just keep adding stuff ad infinitum of just, oh, I need this and I need that and I need this to just make my ecosystem better. If you don't know how to play the instrument, you know, having more keys on the piano, it's just, it's not going to help. It's going to hurt. Yeah. And I feel like there's a cyclical nature in this that predates uh, even social media because uh, like back when Reef Central was the end all be all on the internet for reef keeping. It was. It um, was. <laughs> for a short, yeah, for a short run there. And I was an admin moment. there. I mean, my signature was less technology, more biology. And that was mm -hmm. a rebellious statement because I had witnessed the you know, there was the, uh, you know, Thiel Aquatech platinum wet dries with the ozone, you know, generator and the ozone reactor. I mean, things went gear heavy there in the 90s for a bit. And then there was the counterculture that was like, screw that noise, like less technology, more biology. Right. And, you know, obviously that had its pitfalls because then we went into the deep sand bed world and stuff. But but that's how Joe Barrett and all of that plenum stuff kind of came into the limelight. And now we're kind of full circle where I remember texting you like, all of a sudden, like all these YouTube channels were talking about ozone again, and <laughs> I got nothing against ozone, but it's like, you know, there's some really gear heavy uh, reefs that are kind of in the social media spotlight now. And it's just like, you know, what happened to the less technology, more biology mentality and the simplicity of it, right? Is that if, you know, you and me can participate in this zero reef movement, and demonstrate what is possible with just the absolute stripped down bare bones people will instead of really cheaping out on their lights they'll just skip a whole bunch of other crap like you know skip a bunch of rocks and 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 just silly accessories that they don't need and just buy one good light that they're going to be able to use for eight to ten years yeah. You know, like, like really use it for eight to 10 years that today's generation of higher end lights, that is what they're designed for. That was the, the mindset of reef keeping in our day. And now it's a lot more disposable in nature. You know, you see some setups that look freaking amazing and they're absolutely unsustainable either because everything's planted too close or because you just got that snapshot where you have your acro next to a clam next to a soft coral next to a scalemia <laughs> and you're like yeah that's not a thing <laughs> that's not how that works you made a flower arrangement right you didn't make an actual reef tank and i'm not dogging on on creativity but it's you know we need to better understand what is being presented to us and, and what that means one of the most, uh, I, 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 what's the word? Um, one of the most respected SPS tanks in the Reef Central days for uh, respected SPS coral dominant tanks in the Reef Central days was uh, Thurman was his username. I, I don't know if I, I forget what his uh, full name is, but it was a college at the time. He was a college student. It was a 40 gallon breeder in his dorm room with an Iwasaki, I think 400 watt over it. Mm -hmm. And he built a refugium out of a plastic waste basket, right, uh, yep. off the back. Um, and then he had a hang on the back skimmer. And, I mean, that mm -hmm. tank, I'm sure you remember it. That tank, tank was a beast. I mean, the, the I SPS. I bet you remember the pictures. I don't remember the name. Okay. But, but, but I'll tell you, the people who had the best tanks made the least noise. Yeah. They would, you know, they would come, they would pop up, like, infrequently. And just right? drop a photo and, and they like would a just bomb. drop one, one <laughs> photograph. <laughs> yeah of like the tank that just did not compute in your mind and yeah. you're like what the hell am i looking at this is not right in because it's too right <laughs> and then we'd all like demand more pictures like yo you need to explain yourself you can't just drop into this forum every six to nine months or 12 months and just like oh 
here's my reef tank. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, we're like, wait, what is happening here? This is crazy. No, I do remember those types, but once again, the most uh, uh, successful and prolific, you know, stony coral growers, they, they kept quiet. They didn't, s you know, participate in the bickering and the arguments and stuff. They just did their reef tank. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of want to join you on that venture, but I don't have a giant studio. So for me, it's like if I set just up set, a reef set up tank. One. Set up one. So I may set up a tank where the cost of the tank might be slightly more expensive because it's like an all-in-one, maybe like an innovative marine. But I will keep it simple. You know what I mean? Like I will pester you to get that price down even more. I'll be like... Yo, if you got an all-in-one, you're like you're already halfway there, man. If you're not if you're not power filtering it, you don't belong in this. Well, and that's the thing. It's like I have a 20 gallon long running right now with a internal filter and a power head, and that's it. And it's running great, but I kind of want to expand it to be slightly larger. So I thought, well, I could get like a 30 gallon long tank, which is what if basically like a squat 55 and then just use the mm -hmm. same filtration. But mm -hmm. then, so I may go that route, but those tanks are hard to find locally. So I'd have to order one. I think they're only like a hundred bucks though. Oh my God, I got though. the coolest tank this weekend. It was just sitting in the back of, uh, of this new shop that opened up, uh, keeping it reef in Littleton. Give a little shout out for the soft opening of uh, probably the closest reef store to me. Um, they have some good fish and, and corals and just starting to build up their, you know, their offerings. I think he specializes in like building tanks for other people. But I saw this tank that just kind of blew my mind because it was like a 20 gallon high cut down the long center. So it looks, so it's 18 inches, 24 inches wide, 16 inches tall. Sorry, it's 24 inches long, 16 inches tall, and about six inches wide. And I was, I kept looking at this tank, like, why does this tank speak to me? And I realized, oh, it has a three-two aspect ratio. It basically looks like a little TV. It's not that thin, like a yeah. wall-mounted thing. But yeah, it looks. It, I think it's about 10 gallons, but it looks like a 20 high that somebody just cut down the long the long way to make just this weird narrow strip so i picked up this cool t tank and it's mass produced it's not like somebody cobbled it together it's got a molded frame and everything and i'm just like how have i never seen this tank before so the zero reefs that to me that's just going to be a demonstration because yes mm. i do want to build up to probably like a three or four foot tank that will be a thousand dollars all said and done with just the most unconventional livestock and my my goal is absolutely not to get away from our toys, man. I freaking love our lights, our pumps, our dosers, our skimmers. Yeah, I, I love trying out new skimmers just because that's in my blood. That's my jam. But if when people understand just how much you can do with so little, I feel that they will have the confidence to... Um, you know, invest in some of these higher end uh, devices and know that they're going to get that much more performance out of it, right? You, we've all seen, you know, the folks that get very excited about their reef tank and they spend months or years, you know, just accumulating everything and they just have like the, the, just some, this, uh, you know, the most Instagrammable products or whatever, just whatever's at the top of the shelf. It has the highest sticker price and then they'll cycle it for freaking ever and then they'll start putting fish in it before corals and have like a lot of problems and they'll shut down the tank before it's even you know reached any kind of zenith and so you've seen that happen over and over and you see a lot of people get in over their heads you know everybody's local uh facebook or reef aquarium group or whatever always has somebody who's selling some very lightly used high-end gear for you know uh, used car prices, right? As soon as it rolls off the lot, as soon as you touched it with water, uh, yeah, okay, you, you just lost like 40, 40 to sixty percent of the value of the thing, and then everybody's gonna nickel and dime it. But, but yeah, no, just uh, this is definitely not a response to some of the messaging that's been going on, but me just doubling down on some of the messaging that I've, you know, has permeated uh, reef builders' content for the last twelve to fifteen years. And I it doesn't mean that if you don't like totally strip it down, you're not the cool kids. It just, I just want people to see how little is necessary, especially a child, right? Any kid who's interested in, in getting started, realizing like, Hey, a reef tank without fish is going to be really easy. Um, but pester your parents for about two to 300 bucks and you're, you're going to have a good time. Um, I want them to know that. 
Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think that speaks to how you and I started in this hobby. So, you know, I think... Um, I think there needs to be a focus on that, right? Is is it's not so much even. I, it's the barrier entry that impacts you know the younger generations too, right? Like the the Absolutely. high school kid or the college kid or the middle school kid, right? Um, and and that's where I mean I, we talked about things that we were griping about in the past and stuff, and that was something that I brought up. Like even something simple, like an aquarium lid is vilified. Right. But I'm like, look, if you're a kid that has a tank in his bedroom and you're trying to convince your parents to set up a RODI, uh, in the laundry room, you know, it's like, wouldn't it be nice if your tank barely evaporated? And, um, if you have crappy, crappy water, you just go to the fish store, fill up a gallon jug and you're good to go for a week, you know? And it's just, people don't talk about, it's i mean you brought it up with rodi like when did that suddenly become a necessity right uh, an, an essential absolute. piece of equipment right an absolute uh, you know I, I i consume so much content freshwater saltwater written video podcast like freaking everything like i'm a i'm a, a vacuum i'm always want to know what people are thinking what they're talking about man i watch so much reptile content it's not even funny i'm just <laughs> always hoping to glean like one tiny little trick that uh, we can pour it over but yeah the other day i was just watching a freshwater guy who was saying that you have to have an ro for salt water and in my mind i'm thinking well no, you actually need an ro more for certain freshwater fish <laughs> because there's no point pulling everything out just to reconstitute it with everything that's in seawater in the first place like just use some good carbon like we used to just get by with mostly prime <laughs> mostly dechlorinator you know and plenty of hardy stuff went through um tap water purifier is just a di resin if you don't have huge needs and uh yeah i don't want to beat that horse you know any further into a, the carcass that it already is but um for sure all of my zero reefs are gonna have lids that's 20% of the cost of my $100 budget is finding a good lid. And so I might find a little DIY solution where I can buy one panel to cut into pieces. But, uh, but yeah, just for example, I was at one of the big box stores. And I tell you what, man, I'm pretty sure I could not find these products or those prices or both at most of the stores. Uh, 10 gallon tank, 20 bucks. Power filter, 20 bucks. Heater, 20 bucks. Uh, lid, 20 bucks. That's up to 80. And then there was a really piece of crap LED light that was $20, which made me look at going down to the five gallon so I'd have a little bit more light and filtration for a smaller tank. But then they didn't have tops for a five gallon. <laughs> like they did the tank. I was like, oh. But yeah, all the basics right there, 100 bucks. The lighting is kind of the tricky one, but that was the really fun part about trawling Amazon is I got five filters that are nearly identical <laughs> from five or six different brands and it's not until i use them and put them through their paces am i gonna know is the 15 dollar brand name internal filter is it really that much better than the brown you know brown label one for seven dollars right so when, when you go from seven dollars to a thousand dollars for your filtration just just let's just say a sump there's a lot of room there. There's a yeah. lot of room there to save a ton of money. And we're not comparing apples to apples, but all right. You ready for you ready to go to the deep end of the pool? Sure. Stay yeah. I, I I've got so well, I've got one quick rant and I, yes, I, I, so blame, I blame you for this one. Give it to us, brother. Lay it down. Preach. This one's short, so it won't eat much time. Oh no, I, I like I I'll lap it up. <laughs> so normally, you know, the build phase of a tank is always exciting, and then you get it into its, uh, you know, homeostasis where things are growing and everything's great and everything's fine. And usually, that's when I go and you know wander off and do other things, and I just keep the tank going and I'm happy. But because we have these weekly or semi-weekly discussions. It has forced reef keeping to be so much more in the frontal lobe or whatever you want to call it in my brain that it's causing a sense of dis- dissatisfaction that where I'm like, ooh, I'm not happy with that. Ooh, I want to do that. I want to, it's like I want to do more, which is annoying. So we talk about like fish and cryptic fish. And then I go, you know, like I, I tinkered with a very minimalistic aquascape this time around. I don't have a lot of live rock. I... I don't have a lot of hidey holes. I don't have a lot of coral real estate. 
And normally I would be fine with that. But now because we talk all the time and you'll bring up some cool <laughs> something and I'm like, huh. And then I'm like, oh, and you just, you know, you start to go look at corals online. And then I think about, you know, adding another fish. And then I'm like, ah, shoot, do I have to change my aquascape? Like, do I have to add more rock so I have more real estate for a few more corals? And, and then the other thing was, you know, we talked about cryptic fish. And it's like, there's nowhere for my fish to hide as much. So now I'm now my brain's going down this whole like do I start over and rebuild the structure in my tank, um, and then the other and then I have a massive leather coral right I think it's about 16 inches across. That thing like takes up a quarter of the tank right so <laughs> it's it's awesome having a coral that I've had since what 2006 and just continued to grow and grow and grow. But again, there's a sacrifice with keeping a coral that like you talked about your carpet anemone, right? It's like when you have an organism that large and you don't have a studio <laughs> with a million tanks, I'm like, hmm. So anyway, I blame you for that. So I, 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 I'm not, I haven't been able to just be happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's more of a so, joke. I'm not really that, you know, upset about it. But it's just funny that I see. I, I had like a bunch of corals in the cart at a, at like, you know, an online vendor. And then I walked over to the tank. I was like, well, where would I put them? And then it was mm-hmm. like, crap, I, I don't have anywhere to put these corals. <laughs> so I anyway. want to commend you on your self-control because it's just so easy to buy now and figure it out later. Yeah. And then you really start getting into that I'm not going to call it a downward spiral. I'll just call it a sideways spiral where you put some frags on the bottom and then you get a magnetic frag rack and then you've got frags on the back of the tank and the side of the tank and the bottom of the tank and then you add a little frag tank onto your sump or in your sump you make it you put a little light put your frags down there next thing you know you're like babysitting a bunch of corals that are just not given the opportunity to like really shine and thrive and look their best and the whole hobby is just so much harder for you so I mean, that's great for you to share. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing. <laughs> and I'm not at this I, session. You know, no, it's this is actually a really important point because yeah. you prevented yourself that first step into. You've been there. Yeah. You've been down that path. It's you know where it leads, Mark. And I well, <laughs> and I don't want to go. Um, you know, I don't want to collect a Ritus tank. I don't like those type of tanks. But I mean, there's you know, I, I'd like maybe one more Gorgonian, and you know, just just give me a couple more things. Uh, uh, you know, whereas it's ironically in my five foot tank, I actually had a few more corals because I did have more rock. Right, I had a very mm-hmm. boring horizontal aquascape like almost like stadium seating which i know is people think is terrible because it's not artistic and cool but now i went for these weird rock sculptures and it's like well crap i don't have as much real estate this sucks so yeah these those nsa aquascapes you know their aquascape with the rock i'm not saying that's what you did fully and you just have like these tendrils going up and down and everywhere i'm just like there's there's no hiding places for the fish. So yeah. There's not really many places to put corals. Okay, yeah, you're going to line up some frags, but as they grow out, it's going to look really goofy. And those corals are going to be a lot heavier than you think that structure can hold. Um, but, yeah, no, if you want to do a, a coral trading program, you're, you know, send me your leather. I'll send you a few corals. You get bored of those. I'll send you something else. And then when you miss your leather, I'll send you that back. <laughs> Anything yeah. you want, man. I should I should actually really send you a box while the weather is nice and mild. I'll take it. I'll figure it out. <laughs> you gotta have you gotta, gotta have that bl- that blue hoax of my like to me that is just religious. I just do. a solid teal blue stag with purple or tips. And of all the corals that I have, you know it's uh, you know what's funny is when I was at uh, keeping it reef um, for the soft opening on Saturday, um, some guy recognized me and he was asking me I don't know something something and he was asking me he said oh he's been really looking to get a feminineness rest and the first thing I said I was like don't do it, don't do it. I was like <laughs> just on the spot I was like have you ever dated like a really hot chick, you know one that's just like really needy and needs like that assurance all the time that she's beautiful enough and just has to have you know you spending money on her this and that it's like that's what that fish will be like 
And then he told me he also had a Timor rest. I'm like, yes, that's the perfect substitute. It's beautiful. It's hearty. It's not quite as showy, but at the end of the day, it's not going to stress you out, you know, like the hot chick on the reef. Like Femininist, it, you know what the best case scenario is? And I think his name was Brooks, so shout out to Brooks if he's listening. Um, I think the best case scenario for a Feminist Ras is it gets big and turns into a male. And then it looks nothing like it did. <laughs> Anyone out there looking at Feminist Rasses for like 1000 to $1,200, don't do it. Get yourself a Timor Ras every three or four years. <laughs> and you'll have a lot of money left over. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, that, that the the holy grail fish for me that I, w- I don't want to own unless I'm a billionaire because otherwise I would just lose sleep over it all the time. That it would you know something would happen and it just the stress would just not be enjoyable. Um, yeah, I think I need to get rid of maybe some large leathers that I don't know. But you don't have to get rid of it. You can literally make a few frags. Yeah. You know. You know what I think. That's would be the other awesome thing. You're right. I could trim a lot of stuff down. You know, get more. Uh, you know what I think would be it. really cool, especially in our spirit of retherapy, is make a bunch of frags and offer them up to reefers sixteen and under for free. That's a good idea. Just just pick up shipping. No way. You know, and maybe yeah. I'm sure um, uh, George would love to have kids come in and pick it, pick up some free coral from you because in the meantime they're going to be educated and schooled like that um so yeah that's a that's an open challenge to anyone who's you know feeling like the hobby's too expensive is like all right share some corals make some frags just share them around you know make yourself a couple frags of your long-term leather and just put them in different spots different tanks make sure to safeguard it you know it's going to come back um, but chop down a bunch of the rest and give yourself some some real estate Good point. Yeah. All right. Let's get into uh, let's get into the book. I'm I'm gonna let you. I, I just was one time. I just want to point out that I have this hard copy version <laughs> of the Marine Aquarium. This is a reference. Uh, signed twice. And just copy. like just like the hot chick, just like the Lenardi, I am scared to handle it. I even <laughs> looked through my library just to see if I had the the crummy paperback version, so I didn't have to handle this one. So I'm just like super carefully opening up the pages. But no, I think um, chapter one. It's got a bunch of just oh, absolute knowledge. Um, but this is really like this oh is really yeah. like a, this is really like a textbook. This is not like casual reading. This is the kind of book that if you have really curious nature and want to know the whys behind what it is we do and why we're doing it, every book that was written was referenced a book that referenced a book that referenced this book. This really is just kind of the genesis of reef aquarium uh, knowledge. So uh, why don't you take away, I know you have some ideas of what you thought were cool. So you were talking about pH earlier and this chapter one Give me really a page. Uh, okay, I'll tell you the one that really uh, got me thinking was page 36, which is actually talking about uh, carbonate hardness. Um, but yeah, it, it, I mean, this book literally breaks down what, what is pH? What is alkalinity? What are you measuring, right? Um, Pondus hydrogenii. Right. It even goes into the history of like who, you know, like w- what was its genesis, right? Like who, who came up with uh, that measurement, right? Um, so it's actually a, just an entertaining read. It's like a history lesson. But um, so I won't get into it. You know, I mean, w- w- read the book, right, if you're interested. But the thing that cracked me up because it brought back some memories is um, when he goes into recommending the the carbonate hardness values right and and so he did does bring up natural seawater being around 7 to 10 dkh right but uh again albert thiel peter wilkins those were you know kind of big names in the 80s and 70s in reef keeping and they're recommending a dkh of like 15 to 20. i don't know what test kit they were using <laughs> so First you bring all. up a good point is well what were the you know what were those measurements are they accurate right but um, one thing that I remember vividly is, you know, we did have a lot more nutrient organic rich tanks back this in the is, day. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I remember when the rebellion against the deep sand beds started happening and people were putting, you know, cutting board or starboard in their reefs and going bare bottom, people that would rip out their sand beds, 
certain SPS corals, a lot of times Montipara and stuff, would experience something that was commonly referred to on the forums as alk burn, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you think about alkalinity, it is a um, measurement of essentially a bank of carbonates and bicarbonates that your tank or your water has to neutralize acids, right? And when we talk about low pH and, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, imbalance of, of those acids, um, people focus on carbon dioxide a lot, right? Which creates carbonic acid. But this book goes into organic acids as well and how organic acids get neutralized by alkalinity as well. And so I think when you had a organic acid rich tank, you know, a deep sand bed that's getting a little bit long in the tooth, um, inadequate filtration, you know, filtration has definitely improved quite a bit. I think the impact of having a higher bank of carbonates in your tank was less impactful, right? But once you suddenly start ripping out all of that organic acid source, right, um, that decay, that decomposition, all of a sudden that high bank of alkalinity started to create a problem. And that's what, um, and I could be way off base and some chemistry is going to, chemist is going to school me, but that's what we would see when we would switch to a bare bottom, low nutrient tank is you had to bring your alkalinity down to natural seawater levels. Um, and that got me thinking about all of this stuff online where people are combating their calcium reactors with calc stirrers. They're going after, they're buying carbon dioxide scrubbing media. They're bringing in air from the outside. They're installing these HRVs in their home to reduce the carbon dioxide in their house. And yet when you look at some of these tanks, they have sand beds, they have a high fish population. And I just have an overlying question mark of, why is nobody trying to tackle low pH by tackling organic acids, right? Um, if you really care about having higher pH with your calcium reactor, maybe look at reducing your bioload, your feeding, don't have a big sand bed on the bottom of your tank. Let's translate what organic acids mean. Organic acids mean your sand bed. All of that biofilm that's covering everything, right? All your rocks all your pipes, all your fittings, all your sand, all your sand, and all your sand, <laughs> all that detritus in the corner of your sump. I've, I've looked at some tanks, and, and even like acro tanks, where it was just like a big old tank that had like two inches of sand bed, and I would tell the owner, is like, do you know what I see? I see a 40 pound grouper in your tank, breathing day and night, and so when you're when you have what I've always described as a pet sand bed, you're just you're just you're just not helping your situation out. No. But you're right. Yeah. You know, it's kind of it's not the low hanging fruit to use CO2 scrubbers. I'm 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 putting my reputation down that and for most tanks like that is just a fad that is just kind of pass. Very very specific applications that will last, but that is not the solution you know, or an HRV uh, uh, air exchanger. I'm like, how are you going to do that? But yet you have half an inch of mulm in the bottom of your sump. Which is or consuming. Or you have this thick sand bed. Well, I wouldn't call it consuming. Is getting neutralized with carbonates. So it is a consumer of your alk, right? So if you're complaining about how much two-part you have to use, recognize that your sand bed is one of the consumers of your two-part solution, right? So if you're so adding... So we're talking about two different things. You're talking about the, the mineral consumption, which is absolutely true. No, I'm, I'm talking about all the respiration. When you cultivate a, a ginormous, like excessively large um, biological filter, it's breathing. Like just imagine that biological filter spread out and then squished back into the size of a fish. How big is that fish? That's just breathing in well, your tank. Yeah, that's just fair. not helping your case. It's a contributor to CO2, but it's decomposition produces organic acids, right? Which are not carbonic. Uh, they're not carbonic acid that happens from the breakdown of CO2 uh, binding. It's, um, it's a different acid that's available in your tank that gets uh, bonded and neutralized with carbonates, right? And bicarbonates. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a two part, right? It's one is uh, your pH is low, but the other part is 
um, it's competing for those carbonates, right? Those acids are. Um, and so if you think you're, you're having to add a lot of two part or you have to really drive up your CO2 reactor, which is CO2, or sorry, calcium reactors. Calcium reactors are interesting, right? Because they not only introduce carbonates, but they also in- introduce carbonic acid, right? CO2. Mm-hmm. So right. <laughs> you're, you're, you're building up the bank, but you're also increasing the consumption of that, that, that reserve bank of carbonates. But so to your point, yeah, it's like, um, I, I find it amusing how much money people are spending to chase pH. Me, the other argument I have is we ran, I ran my first calcium reactor in 2001. You and I, most people who've been in the hobby a long time, calcium reactors have been around a long time. And that is one of the oldest, the oldest tools. And we were always just told like, yeah, your pH is going to be a little lower, you know, have a beer and forget about it. And we had mm-hmm. great tanks, but now there's this chase and, and that's fine, but there's an elephant in the room that's consuming a lot of your carbonates and driving your pH down and creating CO2 and it's decomposition. It's, it's a high bio load. Okay. It's a I got, ton I of I got to jump in. I got to jump in with basically it just like two pages down from what you were saying. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Um, he was just talking about um, he was talking about like the buffering capacity of of different things. Oh, oh my let's goodness, see. where's it going? But he's uh, basically I wanted to read it because it was just much better written. And uh, what did he say? So people have been putting you know uh, stuff in their in their in their reef tanks like sand and and rock and oh, stuff yeah, like that yeah, I know where you're as at. a form of, of buffering and what he's saying basically is that within three months and within a year all the surfaces are bound up by these organic acids that you're describing mm-hmm. and uh, magnesium crystals just and the only way to fix that is to dry them out or to acid wash them <laughs> otherwise everything you think that is giving you like a buffering surface after a year it's just like locked in with biology like you can't you can't do it anymore everything you think is you know we always we would always say this right aragonite or dolomite or calcite in your under gravel filter or your substrate it's supposed to be like a you know big reserve for the the carbonates of available for your sand for your for your tank or neutralizing these acids are present but after a year all the surface is just totally locked up in, in biofilm and magnesium crystals and now it's doing the opposite by what you're talking about by being a form of carbonic acids and what I'm talking about being a, a biological surface that's breathing in your tank to break down those acids. It's like literally doing the opposite of what you think it is. And all you had to do was crack a book. Yeah, I thought, of, I mean, that's, and that's just chapter one, right? <laughs> I mean, it got me thinking about how we did chase higher DKH back in our organic mulm rich days. And it got me thinking like, if you really, that worried about pH, you know, maybe it's the, the, the four cubes of frozen food that you throw in <laughs> every yes. day. You know? Yes. <laughs> All right. So I found the pet chapter and I, I think it's really important to read it verbatim um, because Mo, because Mo. Uh, the important thing is not to depend on calcareous filter media for pH control, although they do provide a pH floor of about 7.5 for the system. The buffering capacity of calcareous media is further diminished over time by the accumulation of organic coatings. These organic coatings can be cleaned from the media by washing, tumbling, and grinding. A greater problem, however, is the bonding of free phosphate ions into the crystal structure at the surface of the media. This forms insoluble calcium phosphate, uh, parentheses apatite, and prevents the release of calcium carbonate over time. Magnesium also crystallizes as magnesium calcite magnesium calcite and further seals the surface of the media the limited buffering capa- capability of calcareous media is mostly gone after about a year in marine systems although it can be restored by acid cleaning drying and tumbling i just feel that's on page 41 I'm the second to last paragraph i feel like that washes away decades and decades of what we've been told about having a sand bed for having buffering capacity i'm like that also helps to explain why new tanks do better than old tanks 
mm-hmm. in many cases, right? Yeah, everything's fine, hunky dory when you first set everything up. All the pores on your sand and your gravel are helping to offset these um, pH or carbonic imbalances. But after about a year, if you're not switching out the sand for the buffering benefits of a pH floor of 7.5, mind you, it's not going to do anything to really push it beyond that. Um, every reason that you ever had to have uh, uh, a big surface area of uh, calcium carbonate based substrate is just mostly gone. All right, I'm, gonna I'm sure there's there's I'm sure there's always some caveats. I'm yeah. sure there's always some other cases where okay, maybe the acids build up enough to that it could cause some localized dissolution. But the he says the pH floor is seven point five, right? We don't want to play anywhere near that. Not in the and tank, that floor and not is in the sand key. Bed. Like he's offering that as a benefit, but it's not a benefit we need to really leverage, right? I think in a reef tank is a, it's like mm-hmm. oh, you know, it just having that me that media in your tank just ensures that rock bottom will never go below seven. Five, right? Okay, next sentence. Strong aeration and removal of excess organics and nutrients are the keys to keeping a proper pH level. That's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, if you That's look at everything page you've been saying, 39 organic acids, right, which is different than CO2, right? Tie up bicarbonates and calcium carbonate and reduce the capacity of the buffer system of seawater to maintain high pH. And I'll go a few sentences ahead because I, I think we talked about it already, but a drop in pH due to the accumulation of organic acids cannot be corrected by just an increase in aeration or removal of dissolved CO2. This decline is due to alkalini- a decline in alkalinity rather than the accumulation of excess CO2, excess withdrawals from the buffer bank by the accumulation of organic acids. Like we're talking about decomposition and decay and all of that stuff, that, that breakdown, right? Uh, is only corrected by a water change or more additions of carbonate and bicarbonate. So um, that's the point is like something that could be depressing your pH could be the accumulation of not CO2, but these organic acids, right? This, yes. this decay. They're, they're in not your volatile system. the same way that CO2 is, right? right? You're not gonna just put a scrubber on there and just, oh, magically your pH is back up and just, just solid. And I think it's so funny because you and I really didn't discuss how we were going to talk, start talking about this book. And I think we can revisit different sections in the future, but we both gravitated to these sections in chapter one to, without like planning it at all. And one of the things that really struck me in reading through about the organics and nutrients and trace elements, you know what he always recommends? Water change. He's, he's always throwing it out there. And you got some of these reefers that are acting like, They've mastered some kind of Mount Everest by not doing water changes, but their tank is still less than a year old. So their, you know, the buffering capacity of whatever's happening in their tank has not been exhausted yet, you know. And it's just, it's in the book right here. When was this published? The the eighties. This my book is published sooner than that. What which one was yours? Uh, let's eighty nine. Yeah, first printing, nineteen eighty nine. Yep. Well, and and so. It was funny because you brought this book up, and so I started reading it before, you know, I would fall asleep in bed, just kind of just some reading material to chill out at the uh, end of the day. But I would also mix in watching, you know, a little YouTube and just getting, you know, some some fun reef content going. And it was just funny because I was watching these videos, and I won't mention names because these the folks are I, I do provide really great content, right? But they're just talking about chasing this pH dragon with CO2 and all the mods they've done to their tank. And I'm reading this chapter in the same week, and it almost felt like the universe was trying to be like, hey, you know, <laughs> you know, like this is lost, right? This is lost in translation. It's no longer part of the discussion. And call me a skeptic, right? There's If there's something that somebody can sell and buy, that's going to be the thing that's going to produce the content when it's like hey you know have less fish and feed less if you're worried about the ph and that's the other question that is if you run a calcium reactor maybe just let it be you know like all right i got a little lower ph and i'll I'll dog on it one more time and that was that (laughs) some of the youtube comments on one of the videos were like why don't you just switch to two part and they were like well a calcium reactor is more affordable in the long run i'm like is it i mean you spent money on a calcium reactor and hrv you're buying co2 scrubber media 
You got and to replace the CO2. How much? You got to replace the media. Right, and 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 remember the the amount of uh, alk, you know, two part solution you're dosing isn't like a direct correlation of how much your corals are are building their their stony you know calcareous skeletons. A lot of that's going to your your organics, man. You know, it's yeah. Uh, that's the elephant in the room that's eating all your dinner, you know? <laughs> you know, one of the things we do here at the studio, especially in the coral flats, is we siphon out detritus that builds up in a few corners once a week. It's just easier that way. Uh, but automatic filter rolls, I know those are going to be m- much more popular. Like th- I feel like we're just scratching the surface with automatic filter rolls, just capturing stuff and removing it from the tank before it can go do anything else. Um, you know, I don't have sand in my tanks, uh, minimal live rock. Um, I don't like porosity because of what I just read. Obviously, over time, all those pores are pretty much clogged up and they trap detritus. You know, I spent a lot of time cleaning my sumps, keeping them super clean. We just put out a video yesterday. I saw that, yeah. Of taking pride in your tank and cleaning up your sump. And I know Evan did a good job, but I scolded him when he got back <laughs> from, from that homework because I'm like, you could have done it better. There's a couple things in here, not good enough, <laughs> you know, just, just, it could have been cleaner, better, sharper, but no, that's the whole point is just when you're really in tune, um, those things will naturally be, become just part of the pride of your reef tank. Like take the de- detritus, the piles of detritus that are in your sump or in your tank, like do something with them. Don't just assume that you can let it all fall into your substrate and then add sand sifting gobies and then serith snails and then sand sifting starfish to help process all of that. You're literally creating a whole nother uh, biome that is costing you, you know, a, a beneficial pH and consuming carbonates with the carbonic acid that you're trying to provide to your tank in the first place. That's why I've been calling it a pet sand bed all along. And man, I read that paragraph several times. I was just like, we've, you and I have kind of known this a little bit, but just to see it articulated in a 30 year old book that I haven't read for a really, really long time. Just like, man, there's, there's so much great juicy information in many of the books that have been available for generations. Yeah, I would like... I I didn't get beyond that. I literally didn't get... I was like, that's... that We can just talk about that for a while. (laughs) I didn't get beyond that in the book. Because there's like like a lot of sections on um, different groups of algaes and different groups of animals. Yeah, I... I'll admittedly, I breezed through the phylums, uh, the classification of life. Uh, The feeding was interesting. You know, I mean, there's date... Some of this is dated, no doubt, right? Mm -hmm. But the chemistry section uh, was was chapter one Mm. and really just brought it home you know it's just absolutely it made it sound like everybody else was talking a foreign language for a second it's like why are they also focused on co2 for ph it's like they're they're missing half the equation um and then right in here he said that uh one percent of the co2 in your aquarium is available as free co2 like all the rest i I think it's within the next few pages i don't want to um you know bore our listeners or viewers with just like a long pause but i think he said something to the effect of you know one percent of the co2 is actually free in your aquarium and ready to be pulled out like this so the rest of it is carbonic acids and sure you might be preventing well carbonic acid is a byproduct of co2 whereas i think organic acids are based out of phosphorus and some other stuff too but Mm -hmm. uh but you're right, yeah. I mean, in terms of it being freely available in its original form, I think it's very tiny. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I again, yeah, I, I think we, we we drove it home pretty hard, but it's, at this, it's just an interesting discussion. I'd love for somebody to look at that from an experimental point of view and be like, you know, if I really keep, you know, decay down in my tank and I keep my bio load down, you know, how much of an impact is that on pH? You could do some measurements, right? You could see, and, and that's what I meant by the old forums and the discussions when we started to give up on deep sand beds was this mysterious thing was happening, right? And we didn't know how to react to it initially. So we would call it alkalinity burn, right? Because we removed one of the most massive consumers of carbonates, of alk, alkalinity. It's astounding that back in the day, the suggested alkalinity range was like 15 to 20. Right? <laughs> I think I don't think any of my tanks have ever gotten higher than 13 on accident and I've I'm comfortable at 9 10 
11, I'm starting to really not worry, but just pay attention, make sure it doesn't go any higher than that. But back then, because of all the carbonic acids that they had in their tanks, they had to keep it at like 13 to 15, up to 20. Oh, that's just, wow. Wow, that's just, that really just makes you think. Well, and I, it, I again, this is where I'd love a chemist to chime in because... Um, Organic chemist, because yeah. this is this is tough stuff because it's it's the, it's a measurement of your your water's ability to neutralize acids right so and there's good youtube videos where somebody has distilled water and then they have water where uh sodium carbonate was added right and they put ph meters in both and they start to add um acid right uh i i, I don't know if it's hydrochloric acid or vinegar what they use but it's just an acid it's not even carbon dioxide again we're talking about acids and you could see that the distilled water that didn't have that bank of carbonates in it dissolved, right, drops rapidly. But you could see how the carbonates really, like, neutralize those acids and balance and keep that pH in check. And so, you know, what is the impact of running a higher, putting more money in the alkalinity bank, right, in your savings account for mm -hmm. that rainy day? Uh, for that buildup of and acid. And your sand is not it. The sand is literally the opposite of it. Yeah, especially it's, after it's a year. the dude living in your basement or I racking up the credit card, right? Like he's... Yep. Um, so what is the impact of, you know, having more carbonates than natural seawater normally has available? And why, why, even if you had a pH of 8, three, why was that more tolerated in the presence of organic acids versus... Um, something closer to natural sea. It, it, it's it's still an open-ended question, but I I do know unequivocally that was a very common experience, where we yeah. could get away with really high alkalinity, and it almost became the norm to the point that Peter Wilkins is recommending it. Right? Yeah, fifteen uh, to twenty by Thiel and thirteen to twenty by Wilkins or something. It's yeah. just very different from what you're, we're used to. So I think we might be revisiting that book, or maybe the one thing that was cool is he. Um, uh, referenced his previous book, which was <laughs> printed a few years earlier, Begin at a Breeder. And I was like, dang it, I think I have that copy. But right now I'm talking about this book. Um, but I think, I think it's great to oscillate, you know, in the books that we discuss uh, every now and then. We're not going to give a, a specific rhythm, but we had one old book. And uh, the next book I would like us to really talk about is... The Coral Finder 2021 from Russell Kelly. I mean, this is some of the newest information. It's it, it's it's funny because it's like a like a like a guidebook, you know, and so it just doesn't look like it would have a bunch because but it's uh, 70, 75 pages. But there's like 15 to 20 pictures per page. And I just love seeing these pictures of like. I'm looking right now at just these larger colonies of parietes that are both plating and branching. And we don't get to see that or enjoy that in the aquarium hobby and all these different groups that, um, uh, you know, are, are in pictured in their natural environment. Um, he's got colony shots and then kind of like a closer shots and then like a macro shot. So you can really drill down to the coral identification. Um, this is specifically on stony corals. It's not that expensive. Um, but if you want to pick up this book, go to byoguides.com. Um, this is a book that you'll be able to reference for legit coral identification, not made up names that don't translate to different countries or even different regions of the countries. You know, this is this is um, gospel as of right now. Um, so I think that'll be the next book. Do you have it yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got the it. The Coral Finder 2021. Um, so once again, byoguides.com. Um, I've actually gone diving with Russell Kelly. He's he's such a great chap. I think that's what they call each other over there. Um, but he really knows his stuff, man. He's not some guy just, you know, most of the times when I read articles or, or see ID books, I'm usually f very quickly a, a few pages in just kind of silently dying inside because I see some gr grievous errors. And I look through this book, and I'm like, oh, no, oh, no, this is this is all very, very accurate. And you want to you want to know what corals are rare? Like this book will show you corals that are 
actually rare. Not what the market tells you is rare, but what is rarely seen in the aquarium hobby. And if you and I and uh, are the, the reef therapy crew, including Hayden Sims, who sent me two different species of marilina, you know, really start to recognize the diversity of corals, um, we're going to start to really understand what's actually rare, both in the aquarium hobby and out in the wild. So I'm very excited to uh, talk about this one. I think it'll be a lot more approachable for um, today's crowd, you know, because the Marine Aquarium's reference, he's, he illustrates like several different concepts with like badly illustrated like Microsoft Paint diagrams. Oh yeah. <laughs> I did like, did you, oh, you haven't read it yet. He talks about where he thinks the hobby's gonna go. And oh no, Where, which page is that? Oh man, but he was not far off. And he almost, uh, he pretty much predicted the whole controller thing, you know, like the crazy oh no. um, automation. Find that page later yeah. and, mess and text me <laughs> okay. what, what, where he said that because that is hilarious. But yeah, this is the diametric opposite of that book, Coral Finder 2021. This is like a lot more pictures. And, you know, just just text and descriptions. Okay. Whereas Marine Aquarium I, reference. I found oh, it. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll uh -oh. just, not to continually read from the book, but, you know, Future go Trends, for, page 359. I think we will see development in four directions towards sophisticated small systems into sp spectacular large systems, undoubtedly use of computer controls for automated systems, and an increased development of broad of a broad support industry of food, livestock, and equipment. Right? I mean, <laughs> no, that's prescient for 1989. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, it's just it. Yeah, it's a good book. Uh, Very cool. I, I'm well, I'm grateful book, that you brought it up because it probably wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been one I pulled off the shelf, and mm -hmm. uh, it was just that being felt like I had homework and actually go read it forced me in there. And then I was so glad I did. So me too, because when I was reading the stuff about the, you know, the buffering capacity of different services, I'm like, that's something that we've kind of been saying for like 30 years, but seeing in with this new lens where that was coming from, but also the limitations thereof, um, just really helped to, to crystallize those ideas for me. But I think the next one, like I said, Coral Finder 2021 is going to be a lot more approachable. I think he's doing some workshops through Masna that are, I think, sold out. But um, this guy really knows his stuff with it when it comes to coral ideas. And man, I think it was an awesome session of, of reef therapy. We covered a lot of ground, talking about books, talking about tanks, livestock, and techniques. And uh, God, I can't wait to get back at it next week. Same. It was yeah. good. It was a good so, one. Thanks to everybody for uh, joining us on your favorite podcatcher. Make sure to rate us on Spotify, Google Play, Apple, whatever you're listening to. And if you have any questions um, on YouTube, um, I would like to, you know, a few days ago, there was a big outage of Instagram and Facebook. And what I thought was super hilarious is like, normally when you go to complain about something, you go to Instagram or Facebook. I know Twitter also exists, but it's just not my jam. And so you could go to Facebook to lament and complain about how Facebook was down, but YouTube was totally up. And there's a community tab on YouTube where we can just, I think only us can, can start a a thread uh, but you can put your comments down there and put your questions down there and that's going to be a much more uh, referenceable place for us to pick out questions to answer on sessions of reef therapy so if you go to the main reef therapy channel on youtube there's community tab take a look at it i'll start a discussion there and we'll start fielding some of your questions um especially for those times when uh facebook or instagram are down so thanks everybody for joining us make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and uh mark it's just so much fun man it's so much fun doing this with you and just getting into the weeds of about you know reef aquarium theology and philosophy and and science you know real science and uh we're just gonna keep going in that direction sounds good yeah i'm having a fun fun time with these so uh if i if i sound riled up it it's in a good way yeah it's in a good spirited way so absolutely uh, so thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll catch you guys for another session of reef therapy next week later guys see you guys